Fort Joe. Climate recovery! Climate recovery! Climate recovery! asking you to bless this gathering we're asking you to bless what our young people are doing right now in as much as taking our generation our local government our central government and our corporations and taking them to task and asking them to take care of the future uh, of our planet keep it clean 
Mini Richoni, take care of the water, and Great Mysterious Universe, we ask that you help them with this. Um, they are the children of the future, and as they, as they take on the U.S. government, um, we ask blessings for them and, and a good outcome and awareness to be raised for all individuals on the planet right now at this time. I hope. This is a song for the healing of the body of Mother Earth and all of our children.
you. I like doing that. That's what I'm doing. Sierra Norman is just kind of like my little sister, one of my little sisters here. Um, Sierra, as well as Paul, she has answered the spiritual call as a sun dancer, and so it's a real honor when you when you hear a sun dancer speak, um, because they've dedicated their life to spirit. It's like a Native American monk, kind of, but not. It's full surrender. So we're going to keep the volume down. So do you want to do this without a mic? Is that okay? Sierra is a student at Cabrillo, an activist and a spiritual, a young youth spiritual leader. She is 21. She is your neighbor. She's a Santa Cruz resident and soul sister. So please give a big what for Sierra Norman. Thank you. Beautiful Coyote Medicine Star Woman, Wopila uh, Tunkashira, Pidama Miniwichoni, Wopila Wambli Jaja Zizi Itansha, Wopila Hehaka Owitansha, Wopila Santa Cruz Oyate, Santa Cruz Nation, thank you for all of your smiling faces coming here to support the seventh generation and um, that. that uh, prayer that they're doing uh, to help change the world, to help change Mother Earth. Um, I'm a sun dancer at um, a Dakota uh, sun dance in Iowa with Chief Golden Light Eagle from the Incan Sioux Reservation. Um, I want to say a big thank you to Chief Elkman um, who is here right now and um, you know he wants to remind you all that you're all Earth Guardians. And we have to tap into our DNA and remember our sacred responsibilities. To respect our own body is to respect our foundation. And to honor our femininity and to honor our woman is to honor Mother Earth's heartbeat. So that same heartbeat Mother Earth has, we all have. And um, I'm choosing to sing and pray a uh, Sundance song for those warriors. Um, Journey Zephyr, my family, like that. And uh, that song, it says, Wonka Tonka, Great Spirit Tunkashila, uh, have pity on me for, for I want to live. And I think that's the case right now, you know? Our youth, we're very aware we want to live. We want to be able to see Mother Earth radiate her light for the next generations to come. We want to continue to live on this planet because if we continue to destroy her, we won't be able to live here. So we pray uh, in gratitude for her replenishing herself and healing herself every day and um, those warriors. So thank you. I'm going to start singing.
It's emotional, isn't it? Like the, the spirit and the song and the prayer and what we're standing for. I mean, it's no joke, right? But we can have fun still. Yeah. So I want to read, I want to play for you guys this message from Journey Zephyr. Journey is one of the 21 youth. He made this recording. <laughs> he made this uh, recording for us for Santa Cruz because, as you guys heard, his, his dad, who is also a chief, uh, used to live here. Um, before he passed away last July. And um, so Journey lives on Kauai. He's going to tell, oh, it's about two minutes, so if we could have your attention. And I wouldn't mind you guys kind of coming a little closer if you want. Everyone seems really far away, especially the kids. When it comes down to it, do what you want. Don't forget we have to keep access, you guys, okay? We have to make sure there's access to the corporate. Yeah, you guys, kids. Kids, come forward, please have a seat. Come relax. Journey Zephyr for us from Santa Cruz. Let's see how this goes from the phone to the to the mic. Journey Money, Zephyr from the Aiken Sioux Indian Tribe, and I live in Hawaii. I'm 18 years old. I'm one of the 21 youth is suing the federal government over climate change. I want to thank everyone in Santa Cruz for coming out to support us youth on our planet today. Today is the day we're supposed to be in court fighting for our generations and our future generations right to a stable and healthy climate. Sadly, the government is fighting against that and is attempting to deny us those rights. The government is uh, continuing to stall our case and make excuses as to why they can't go into court with us. We, can allow, we cannot allow them to stall this case anymore, not for one more day. My generation is almost out of time. We are out of time. Where I live in Hawaii, an entire island disappeared just this month due to rising sea levels and intense hurricanes from climate change. It was called East Island and the National Marine Monument. It was a sanctuary for endangered Hawaiian sea turtles and monk seals. Our coastlines and beaches in Hawaii are dramatically shrinking every year. I spent most of the summer watching the Weather Channel as impending hurricanes crept closer and closer to us with each storm. The warmer ocean waters are making it easier and easier for hurricanes to trek north up towards Hawaii. We had 2,000 year floods on my island in just six months this year, and several hurricane warnings. The government is, uh, the government needs to act now, or it's only going to get worse. Climate change threatens the life, liberty, and property and well-being of not just my generation, but everyone. For over 50 years, they've known that climate change would worsen to this degree. We will not be silenced. We will stand up, and we cannot give up. We are out of time. Thank you again, Narayani, for sharing your heart and for having Journey show up with us. That message is so important. I'm going to invite all our youngest people now up onto the steps, including Cassie and Talia and friends. Anybody else that wants to come up, Bodhi's going to start a chant for us. Come on, Bodhi, right? Water is life. You can't drink oil. Water is life. 
truth spoken from the mouth of a four-year-old. Up next on the mic is a dear, dear, dear friend of mine, Cassie, 11-year-old from Gateway Elementary School, and she has prepared a few words about why she cares about the planet Earth, something along those lines. Thank you, Cassie. I care about the Earth because of all the animals, and there's a few animals that it affects is polar bears and turtles. When the sun shines down on the polar bears' icebergs, it melts all the ice, which means there won't be as many polar bears. And on turtles, when there's more heat, there won't be as many females. There will be more males born. So that also affects their population. And we need to care about the Earth because then we have more animals and more animals will be able to live, and that's what we want. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we're bringing some backdrop up, make it prettier. The waves are rising. These were all decorated by local children at various events, Earth Day, uh, natural bridges, uh, one at festival, etc. <clears throat> Colleen Seals has been heading up 350 Org here in Santa Cruz for many years, and she's one of the most powerful grandmothers I know. I'm so grateful for her presence. I hope you all are um, up with the 350 Org website. They have a lot of information about climate change. They're also brought with us today um, a resolution. Pauline, do you want to talk about that now? Mine as well? Not sure where we're at on the... Yeah, it is you. You're next. It's even on their agenda. Good job! <laughs> So we've been around for a while, we call Santa Cruz Climate Action Network and we include 350 Santa Cruz. We've been working a lot on just trying to educate people but lately we got impatient. And so um, Dana and Susan who are here put together this resolution based on ones that had already been generated by some other progressive cities, Berkeley and some other places. We gave it to city council Dana, could you pick it up, please? It's on that little table there. We gave it to City Council in August, and then we followed up with a picture account. No, no, the whole binder. Do you want to bring the whole binder up? Yeah, so we gave them, and we gave them a whole binder with pictures of, because the way resolutions are done, you say, whereas this is happening, whereas the Paris Agreement, whereas the hurricane. So we gave them pictures as well. We gave them the legal stuff and the pictures. And we followed up again. So um, I'm not going to try to go through all this right now, but it's here. You're welcome to look at it. And we have all the material on our website. We set up an online Facebook petition that people could sign. And today we're collecting paper signatures. So if you think the city should be doing a heck of a lot more than they are doing, please sign this before you leave. We also have little um, surveys for people to fill out who want to get more involved, who maybe up till now, well, gee, I'm too busy, but heck, this is so bad, I want to do something. We've got a little survey form you can fill out that can help us figure out how to get connected because there's so much to do there's things we are involved in, many things we're involved in already. Not just this city council thing, we also want to get involved with the county and the school boards. We're also looking at food waste, which is a huge source of greenhouse gases, and something we can do something about locally. We work together with the transportation group, the campaign for sensible transportation, and um, there's a lot of other things we'd like to do, but we're spread a little thin. So if people want to set up a 
tree planting activity or so my favorite project lately has been one called keep it cool we've gone around to the local businesses and in santa cruz right so okay there so uh, my favorite project has been uh, keep it cool we've been going around to the different businesses in santa cruz and talking to the owners and asking them if they could keep their doors closed while they're running heat or air conditioning. New concept, right? <laughs> so the idea is some of them will say, well, you know, we'll do it if our neighbors will do it, kind of a thing. So we're trying to get, get the ball rolling on that. If you see a Keep It Cool sticker um, in one of your local shops, tell them thank you and give them their bus your, your business if you can. And if you would like to help us recruit others, please let us know. We'd love to have you. So um, we have quite a lot of literature, um, informational things. We also have a teaching program where we go to schools and try to teach a whole unit on climate change. So we've got information on that. So if you know anybody might want to be involved with that or might need that, uh, just let us know, and uh, if you aren't already on our email list, sign up for that and check out our website. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to introduce another youth speaker, 10-year-old Nova. Um, her and her mom are community leaders. I'm really grateful for their presence. And you're at what school again? Elementary school. So thank you so much, Nova. Uh, I'd just like to share a few short words about um, how we need to stop climate change. So I'm just going to jump right in. Yeah. Climate change is a big part of our world right now, and if we don't do, um, if we don't try to defeat it, imagine what our future will be like. That is why we are here. We are here to stop this chaos that is making our beautiful air fill with ugly fumes. We are here to stop luscious plants from being crushed by oil industries, and we are here to support our future. Checking? Oh, girlfriend, get over here. I'm like, where is Eva? Sorry, I didn't see it's been a couple weeks or something. All right, Eva is taking over on the mic. Yeah? Yeah. Let's hear it for Eva! I'm the official master of ceremonies. So, I didn't prepare a single joke, but I'm pretty sure they'll just come naturally. Um, so I have some notes. Okay, so we're going to introduce Dina whenever you're ready. I don't think the official notes are the same. This is the one that these are brought. Okay, absolutely. Okay. I'm trying to walk into the studio. Do you all want some more information? Information? I'm just going to turn it up while you're talking. Would anybody like to hear more information about what's going on, or shall we go on to speakers? Okay. How about some poetry? Poetry. All right. I don't know if I have any. So come on, Dina. Like up to your mouth. I'll introduce her. Thank you. Trying to find the right. I'd like to introduce Dina Eldasuki. She is a local professor, a poet, a mother, a wife, a sister, a woman of spirit, a woman who takes care of elders and cares about the planet and cares about the children and cares about you and she's a neighbor and a friend and it's an honor to have her share um, her art with us. So please give a big round of applause for Ms. Dina. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for um, allowing me to speak. And I want to um, say that this poem that I wrote, I orig originally wrote it for the Ebb and Flow River Arts Festival, but I think it's really pertinent here. Um, 
because we all rely on water. And um, it's a poem of celebration of our local waterways here. Um, and as you may know, one of the biggest issues that we're going to be facing with these, uh, with what's happening with climate change um, that we're contributing to is saltwater intrusion um, of our local waterways and our water sources potentially being compromised and um, fresh water potentially being a more and more limited resource. So this is a poem in celebration of our river and I, I don't usually like to say too much before um, I share a poem, but um, I'm just gonna ask that everybody uh, consider saying a prayer for your local waterways, for your rivers. Anytime you're near a body of water, connect with that. Anytime you're taking water from the faucet, connect with it and acknowledge with it and see what changes for you as you make that a practice for yourself. Thank you. Um, so this is called Redwood Highway. If you only know her through filters, you'll never understand why nests cling to the bridge's underbelly, born from her cool mud. If you press your ear to her dry bed, the language of bobcats is as audible as tangled deer tongues, and the white noise of egrets rivals grizzlies thundering over stone, and salmon fry coo and gurgle, a litany of old souls waiting to be born again. If you press your navel to her mouth, be prepared to drift across the wave's smooth lip like a redwood plank sanded and sealed and floated from her toes to her head under the watch of brown and princely eyes sparkling clear like a late 19th century July day on the western edges of Turtle Island. If you soar, wings fanning, a passing cloud over her body, she'll bloom into a bouquet of veins. Some will thirst more than others. Inject them with your own humanity. Dilate them with light. Nurture them with their own divinely ordained purpose. Neglect not even the dankest or most stagnant of corridors. If you press your feet into her silted breast, don't be surprised if you find your own pulse there between your toes. Thank you. Thank you Tina. Rick Nolthenius, a Cabrillo professor who teaches classes about climate change. If you are a speaker, would you please come to stage left for, for any reason so that you are accessible for live streaming purposes? We're going to want this for our backdrop, okay? So that's our, our backdrop. Oh, speakers are Yeah, okay. So, Ava? Is that okay? So, you guys, so we're going to have a little shift here. So everyone to inhale, take a deep breath. 
You're so beautiful. Please come around closer. We're going to shift this way so that for the live streaming and the film, we're going to actually use this backdrop of our signs. So please come in, come closer, have a cookie. There's some water. Or is that not for everybody? Yeah, I have a cookie. We're abundant. We're in Santa Cruz. Great. Okay. Ava, would you just give a, um, would you just take a moment and tell everyone like why you're doing this and why this is important to you? Thank you. So my name is Eva. I was born and raised in Santa Cruz. And I spent the first six years of my life in the beautiful Santa Cruz mountains. Um, I'm 20 years old. I was gonna speak at this event and then Plans change, and they asked me to MC. Um, but climate change is still something that pretty much constantly, uh, physically and emotionally affects me. I feel constantly perturbed and upset about the state of affairs, but especially the state of affairs that gives way to this travesty that is climate change. Um, especially considering that I don't really think it's any of our fault. I don't, I don't like look around and blame anybody that I see for the way that the earth is changing. Um, I blame like institutions and I blame corporations and people making decisions on behalf of me and my peers and everybody here, you know? <laughs> And so, you know, it's not something that I could like go and yell at somebody and tell them to change. Like, I can't tell any of you to change so that climate change stops. I can't tell any of you, any of you that there's action you can take as an individual on like a day-to-day -day basis. Like, certainly, stop eating meat, stop driving your car. Like, there's so many things you can do, but it just, it isn't enough. It just isn't enough. And so I'm really moved by these kids that have taken it into their own hands and, and made an action, a pretty massive action, an unprecedented action, that I think, I think might lead to something, even if it doesn't work out and they don't win the lawsuit or whatever. No! But, no, but it, it's not about that. It's, it's about this, this like, world-moving event where they're, they're saying the government is responsible, which they are. Our government sucks for doing this to us. They're, they're like, really messing up on the day-to-day, -day, like, it, it's, it's insane to me that nobody is calling the government out every day. That we're not like, hey, government, you're messing up. You're messing up. Please stop. Please stop. And these kids are doing it. And they've been doing it. And I'm proud to be, you know, the same age of the, as them. I'm, I'm proud to be um, here with you all today to be introducing our beautiful speakers. Um, and I, uh, I feel honored to be here. So thank you all. My name is Eva, and we'll be speaking again. This is Rick. Eva's absolutely right. There's, there's no yeah, way that we're... You hear me? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Eva's absolutely right. Um, uh, I do not go around finger-wagging these people about their personal carbon carbon footprints because really it's not going to make any difference. You should do those things because they feel good internally, but they're not going to change the world. To change the world, you have to do what these kids are doing. We're going to have to hold our institutions responsible. Uh, I, I struggle with this every single day to wrap my mind around the betrayals that are happening, my generation to these young people and my adorable nieces and nephews and grandnieces and nephews. I, I, I just struggle with it every day. Um, it's become my passion to try and educate people on climate. Uh, I have a course called Astro 7. It's a little surprising it's in the astronomy department, but frankly my research and my interest in my education now is very much focused on, on climate change and, uh, and less so on astronomy than it used to be. Uh, I would urge any of you who are interested in learning more about climate, not just the science, but the, the course covers actions that we can take, uh, the economics and the politics, uh, frankly, even the psychology, the psychopathologies that are going on, um, the nature of capitalism, etc. And it's a really, really difficult problem. I, I don't know how we're going to solve it, frankly, because it seems to get right down to human nature. 
our, our desire, our compulsion genetically given to us to grow. Civilization itself is actually an institution we made to help us to grow. And that was all fine when we were just a small part of the world. But the world is finite and we have reached those limits and gone beyond them. And now we have to go back. We have to go back. And nobody really wants to look at that except maybe you find people here. But we cannot continue to grow on a finite planet. We have to backtrack. We have to find a way to do that. I think that's going to take an unbelievable transformation of human psychology and human maturity. And the only thing that gives me some hope is that there are some people, like you people, who do understand that and who really passionately, from your heart, want to see that happen and are willing to go out and work for it. It's not all just the corporations. They may run things, but there are still real people out there, good people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. I really appreciate it. the youths. Um, we're going to have our first student speaker, Camille Gamboa. That's you. Uh, she's a junior in high school, a rock and roll musician, and a youth leader. Let's give it up for Camille. So, I mean, we're all here for the same reason. We all want the same thing. I think it's gone too far. The government just keeps messing up and and we we need to make change. And we're, I think for example, the um, coral reefs. The coral reefs are just being completely decimated. We're polluting them and just tearing up their foundations. And some studies show that within a very short amount of time, the coral reefs could be completely extinct at the rate we're going. And this could, com this could kill like millions of species. So we really, we need to take action. And this is, I mean, that's what we're doing. We're taking action. And I think that's really important. And, and I mean, yeah, I just, guess I just want to thank everyone who's here because this is just, it's so devastating what's happening and, and what people are doing. And, and a lot of people just, they don't understand. They don't care. They ignore it. And I mean, we need to speak up. We, this, I feel like this is kind of our responsibility to, to make, it, make it so everyone hears us. We need to be heard. Um, so yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Camille. I hear you. Next, we're gonna have another student speaker, Quinton Freeman. Is that you? Amazing. Uh, Quentin is a senior, you're 16 years old and you're a senior, wow, 16 year old senior at PCS, Pacific, Santa Cruz Pacific Collegiate School. Um, she wants to be an engineer, an architect, or an architect. Welcome, Quentin. So, how many of you have been to the boardwalk? Well, most, if not all. Um, and what about Capitola Village? Yeah? Okay. So, I'm 16 years old. If our country keeps emitting greenhouse gases like it is now, um, sea level in Santa Cruz could rise as much as five feet within my lifetime. Putting landmarks like those, as well as neighborhoods like Beach Flats and Lower Ocean at huge risk of flooding. Climate change is not just some distant issue for future generations to solve. It is happening here and it is happening now. This is not an inevitable future, though it may feel like one. It is simply based on the way things are now. As a society, we need to take responsibility for how we use energy, land, and water. We cannot go on cutting down trees to dedicate the land to industrial farmland, profiting neither the community nor the environment. We cannot go on relying entirely on coal, gas, and oil to power our electric grid, especially as renewables are becoming increasingly efficient and affordable. 
We cannot go on letting a third of our food go to waste as a, thir as a third of our country does not know where their next meal is coming from. <laughs> These are the practices that have got us this far. And if we want any chance at a future for my generation, our children, or our grandchildren, then something needs to change, not just on a personal scale, but a national one. As important as it is to personally use resources responsibly, the vast majority of this pollution and exploitation has been at the hands of major corporations and industry. This is not to say that you shouldn't switch to solar or drive a hybrid, because it is absolutely better than the alternative, and things as simple as reducing your food waste can make a difference. But it is simply not the entire solution. This might sound daunting, and it is, especially in our current highly polarized political climate. but we need to tackle climate change from a wider perspective, to pull bigger levers and address the bigger problems. And it's exactly this, that to the 21 youths from Alaska to Louisiana meeting in, meeting in Eugene are trying to do right now in their federal lawsuit against the government. <laughs> Our global climate has not always been such a divisive and politically charged issue. Ten years ago, Republicans were calling out the fossil fuel industry for causing climate change and putting forward policies to protect the environment. The scientific consensus that the use of fossil fuels is the direct cause of global warming has been enough to pull most of the world along towards a cooperative solution in order to preserve the sanctity of our planet, our resources, and our lives. And yet today in America, the money and clout of the oil industry and other fossil fuels have swung the Republican Party into its favor. Party lines dictate belief in climate change, environmental policies are being slashed, and our federal government refuses to hear the voices of its citizens. Something needs to change. I am 16 years old. I am leaving Santa Cruz next year for college, and I don't know when I'll next live here. I have spent my youth treating the sea and the redwoods as a playground, not living in fear of floods encroaching on my doorstep. And despite Santa Cruz's flaws, it is perhaps easier here than in the rest of the country for young people to find acceptance and make their voices heard. It saddens and frightens me that these two core values of my hometown are at stake, not only here, but especially in the rest of America. When I return to Santa Cruz as an adult, I don't want it to be washed into the sea or for the youth of the next generation to feel unable to share their voice. I am 16 years old and it is my future. It is our future. It is the future of those who dare to pull on the biggest levers, to challenge the people who unfairly hold power and to take it back, and to call out anyone who would continue to lie, pollute, and silence the voices of our nation. We must continue to speak out louder and louder. We must continue to stand by those who are making change, to listen and lift others up, those who might not have the privilege to have this platform and yet have just as much stake in our future as we do. We must continue to follow the lead of Youth v. Gov to take big action and not simply hope that our Priuses will solve the issue. Those who are old enough to vote need to vote next week and hold our government responsible for the future of our country. Those who have polluted the world the most are old, and the youth are getting louder. It is our future, and we deserve a say in it. Thank you. Dang, Quentin. <laughs> True. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm dumbstruck. That was beautiful, really. Um, now we have... Oh, here we go. Now we have Xander Balthazar. A senior, you got to... Santa Cruz High. Yep. Uh, Santa Cruz High Senior, 17 years old, and he wants to be an astronaut. I guess I want to be an astronaut. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, I'm Xander. Um, I guess the reason I'm here today is because um, I feel like I have to be. Um, you know, I you know, talking on stage really isn't my favorite, but you know, I, the way I see it, it needs to happen now. Um, you know, um, you know, I'm here because in you know in under 50 years, like you know, like Quentin said, the boardwalk will be underwater. Um, you know, the Amazon rainforest could be completely gone, and like all these, you know, tons of crazy things you hear about it every day. Um, I'm here because um, because I feel like you know I need to make a change because clearly the government doesn't feel the same way. Um, um, I'm here for you know just not for me and my generation, but for you know our kids and their kids and you know generations to come. Uh, you know, it, it seems like um, like the government's turned their back on us. You know, they're they're getting like thousands and millions of dollars every year from um, from the oil industry, and you know they don't have to. You know, it's the money that the these companies are giving them. Um, you know, they don't have to. They don't have to change the decisions they make in the court and in politics. But they will if they want to keep their pockets full, and you know that's just what's happened, um, and that's not right. So I, I guess uh, you know this. It needs to change. You know, it needs it needs to happen, and I can't believe it has yet. I can't believe it's you know things haven't changed and things haven't gotten better. You know, I mean, global warming is like a widely accepted fact at this point you know almost if you go in there you know almost all the people in there will agree that global warming is real it's happening it's proven and um but there's still cars everywhere everywhere you go there's cars um and on a, at an alarming rate i mean every person has a car that's just how people get around and so you know it blows my mind that you know people you know they're talking the talk, but you know they're not walking the walk yet. So I think you know it's my responsibility and it's our responsibility to come out here and um, you know get people to start walking the walk. And what better place to do that than in the courtroom? Yeah. Thank you. Nice. I think we're gonna have some 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 young people. Uh, you want to speak for a moment? Uh, yeah. Okay. What's your name? Richard. It's Richard Todd. Impromptu. Uh, I'm 65 years old, and first thing I want to apologize to all the young people here. My generation let you down. I was involved in the resistance movement in the 1960s and in the 1970s. But I got pretty discouraged, like a lot of my generation did. And what we did after George McGovern was so soundly defeated by Richard Nixon, who was already very much like Trump, we decided to go shopping instead. And so whatever revolution we occurred, a counter-revolution was put in place. And we're living with that counter-revolution right now. What's required, I think, it's great that we're all here, but look, turn around and see all the people out there that are not here. And what's needed is for those people out there to understand that climate change is the biggest threat to their shopping excursions they could ever know. And it has, it's not just rising sea level, and that's what they think it is. It's more than that. When climate falls apart, the entire social structure of this planet falls apart at the same time. Meaning that the tribalism that you see in Afghanistan is something you're going to see right here in Santa Cruz. So it's going to be, what do they call it, the dystopian future? That's what we're looking at. And that's how important this message is. So what we need to do is we need those people out there to understand how important this is. And in order to do that, we have to create a tipping point in attitude about climate change, meaning that the entire country 
starting with the United States, needs to understand the importance of it. Not just us here on the liberal left, we're not enough. And it, we don't really have time for us to grow in the incremental ways that we are. We need a massive change in attitude that's got to occur over a very short period of time. Now I'll give you an example of that in U.S. history. On December 6th, 1941, the United States was an isolationist nation who cared nothing for what was going on in Europe. And at that point, the fascists had taken all of Europe and now on December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor was bombed by the fascists from Japan. And on December 12, 1941, Hitler declared war on the United States. Now, the attitude of the country, of the people in this country, from December 6th to December 13th, let's say, was massive. They got behind what needed to be done in a huge way. In other words, a tipping point was created. Okay. Mm. That is what we need. I got a schedule. I, I'm sorry. I think, I think yeah, that what I'm point. saying is very important and I know that the bureaucracy doesn't want me to proceed, but you need to think about this and you need to talk about it with other people. And I'm working on a project right now about tipping point. You guys give another uh, round of applause for Richard. You know, we honor our elders in Santa Cruz. Um, I'd love to have tea with you and talk to you and find out because it's important that we hear your voice and in no way will we ever want you to stop sharing your truth. Thank give him another round of applause, please. Please, absolutely. Um, we're on a tight schedule. We have um, Dana Sheehan from Romare Institute and other speakers, so thank you so much. Yep. Great. Um, we, what? How do you reach him? I mean, does he have a website? Do you want to give your website information? Maybe? Some, I have a request for further information. Website? I have it actually. Right now I'm specializing, I'm a photographer and I specialize in resistance photography. It's revereimages.net. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to hear everybody. We worked so hard on organizing this and trying to get as many people in as we could, and we uh, got restricted in our time permitting. So anyway, um, we want to do a quick chat real quick, so I want to hear you guys. Okay, real quick, real quick. Let's do something. Okay. Let the youth be heard. 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 to do that one because I really want to bring it back to the to the lawsuit and what's going on with that again um, right now the Supreme Court has temporarily stayed the case again and these children have been trying to get in court for a long time we have Daniel Daniel Sheehan a constitutional lawyer who's been oh my goodness through the trenches for years and he's going to share a little more about that but before we have Daniel come on I would really 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 invite everybody to take a group photo okay one of my most important reasons for being here is again to support the 21 kids and I want them to see how many of us care so if we can all come behind this banner we're going to take one photo and then we'll move on with the rest of our speakers Daniel Sheehan, Catherine Shea and Drew Glover All right, so Mexico, we go up behind as well, the little one's in front. Al, you got this. I think Jim's going to take a photo. You can, you can, you can. There you are. I know. Okay. 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 All the children in front. Hey, how are you? 
perhaps you go further away to get the actual photos. There you go. We have to get further we'll get, away. Okay, we're going to use a live, live picture. So. Chief Counsel of the Lakota People's Law Project. He uh, went to Harvard College and Law School. He is a constitutional lawyer on the right side of law. In the Iron Contra case, Watergate, Pentagon Papers, Three Mile Island nuclear plant shut down, the Greensboro Massacre against the KKK and the American Nazi product, Project Party. Yes. And he uh, worked on behalf of Standing Rock. I've known and seen Danny Sheehan throughout my life. He is a wonderful man, and I am honored to introduce y'all to him. Great. Well, I'm, I'm used to being uh, part of the youth. Uh, when, when, we, when we sort of came on the scene uh, back in the 60s, uh, everybody kept telling us that we were too young to be listened to then. Uh, and it turns out that it stays that way uh, all the way through. So uh, don't, don't feel that you're being discriminated against as the young, uh, because it's not your youth that they're afraid of, it's what you're saying. And it's what you're saying that they try to disregard all the time. And so what you have to do is you have to build alliances. It's the thing that we came to know uh, over all the years. You have to build alliances with the young people, with the, the middle-aged people, with the older people, all the people that are still coming on into the stream, the young, the really young kids. You know, this is, this is a coalition that you have to build. When we did the Karen Silkwood case, which uh, ended up stopping the construction of all private nuclear power plants in the United States. That, that, uh, that Sarah Nelson, our executive director over here, uh, was, the, was the National Labor Secretary for the National Organization for Women, uh, and I was the legal counsel for the United States Jesuit Order. And so if we can put together an alliance between the National Organization for Women and the Jesuit Order, we ought to be able to get an alliance uh, among everybody here. Wow. Because, because it's in everybody's interest to stop global climate change, except for the petroleum companies and the fossil fuel industry. Now, the, the fact of the matter is, as you know, there's a lot fewer of them than there are of us. But the fact of the matter is, the structures of the system are structured in a way to give them much more influence. As long as you rely upon a vanguard theory of social change. The vanguard theory of social change is that you sort of go to the elite and you ask them to voluntarily agree to stop doing things that are to their advantage. Now you can imagine that that doesn't work that well. <laughs> And what we have, we've had for many, many years, we've had the courts that we were able to go to to force that elite to stop doing some of the things that they were doing, like in the Karen Silkwood case, or in the Iran-Contra case where they were smuggling weapons down to the Contras that had already been overthrown and thrown out by a popular revolution, but the American Central Intelligence Agency was still providing weapons and explosives for all of them. 
Uh, and so we went to the courts to try to get them to stop doing that. And that was the beginning of the point in time in the 1980s when Ronald Reagan and George Bush came into power when the courts started being taken over by all of the extreme right-wing elements because it was after the end of the Cold War that the robber barons who had risen to power back between the end of the American Civil War I know that the Vietnam War probably seems to a lot of you young folks like the Civil War but, but, it, but it, it turns out that, that in the aftermath of the American Civil War the, the elite that were in charge of the major uh, businesses in the country developed a new theory of uh, a new business vehicle called the shareholder owned private corporation and the corporation started being designated as a person and the person was supposedly invested with all of these fundamental rights that belong to a human being and that was designed by their corporate lawyers that they put into the courts and it's important for us all to understand here on the eve of pushing to try to get the courts to, to protect us uh, against environmental uh, change that we need to understand that the Trump administration is getting ready to appoint 236 new federal judges 236 new federal judges and they're they're assaulting these judges into the courts where they don't have control yet for example five new judges are being appointed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and it's the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals that we're dealing with here and they've already appointed you know five full justices to the United States Supreme Court and they're hanging out getting set to do more if they possibly can so it's extremely important that you start to understand at this point that there is a, a mobilization that needs to be undertaken on the grassroots level where we have to mobilize and organize and go door to door talking to people all across the country to get them to throw these people out of office. That that's the key to this thing, to throw them out of office. Uh, and that has to be done through the state legislatures and the, and the, the state assemblies, the, the state senates, all the way through the country. The fact of the matter is, I'm here to tell you that, that I have over a 50 year period, uh, probably you have one of the highest win rates in the court system of anybody that you're ever going to meet. Uh, ever since coming out of law school and winning the case of Eisenstadt versus Baird to establish the right of unmarried people to have access to birth control. That was the very first case I ever did. Uh, and I was in out of prison and everybody was killed there. And we got the case overruled where they were blaming their inmates for killing the, the, uh, the, the hostages. And we've done the Iran Contra case. We've done all these cases. So I'm not speaking to you out of a position of weakness. We've won these cases. But I'm trying to tell you right now that you have to supplement the action that you're doing in the courts now with grassroots organizing in public education. You need to go on every single radio station that you can get on. You want to go on to every television station, every local television station show that you can get on. You have to take this country by storm. That you represent the second largest generation in the history of the world. You know, after the baby boomer generation. And the good news is that there's enough of us left to be allies with you. Okay? So that's, that's, I'm, I'm just trying to get the message through to you that I'm completely supportive of the action. I'm completely familiar with every single step that's been taken in your case. It's gone back and forth and back and forth, you know, from the district court to the, to the magistrate, to back to the district court, up to the court of, uh, up to the court of appeals, up to the three judge panel, up to the on bank, all the way to the Supreme Court. Now we have the United States Supreme Court completely controlled by five extremely reactionary justices who have taken the extraordinary step of reaching down all the way to the district court trial court level to stop a trial to stop the trial because they're afraid of the evidence that would come in okay so that you need to understand that this is their ball game controlling the courts right now but until we re 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 gain control over the courts, which I think we're going to be able to do, but it's going to take a decade to be able to get control of these courts. So you have to now, with the, with the verve and vigor of youth, you have to join with us 
who still have enough verve and vigor left to work with you on this, to get out into the streets, uh, to demonstrate, to get into the, to, into the homes of people by knocking on the doors and going to visit them, going to all of the meetings of the labor unions and the teachers associations, the PTA meetings, everywhere that you can get a chance to be heard and to demand the steps be taken by all the citizenry to put people into the representative legislative positions to change these laws. That has to be done because you are not going to be able to rely exclusively upon the courts any longer for the next decade or more. And that's all we have. We only have this coming decade to turn this around and to bring this global climate change to a stop. Okay, we know what the seriousness of this is. You know what the seriousness of it is. And so that this has to be done, and it has to be done with a revolutionary zeal. A revolutionary zeal. Because you do not want to have happen what is the only alternative here. The only alternative is a major revolution against these people, and they have a lot of guns, they have a lot of armored personnel carriers and tear gas. We faced it. We faced it up at Standing Rock when they mobilized. They put a thousand troops into the field against the unarmed Lakota people. And they tear gassed them, they shot them with rubber bullets, they threw uh, canisters of explosives at them. You know, they arrested, you know, 842 of us, you know, and put, put them in jail. We fought them to a standstill. We've gotten over 700 of those cases acquitted yeah. uh, now. And, and we. And so that I'm, I'm telling you, we're, we're fighting this, this fight on the judicial level, but you have to fight it at the grassroots level, just like this, just like friends and neighbors. You have to go door to door in these other places. We have to get out into the congressional districts, out into the other Senate districts. And in this place, of course, this place, this place voted for Dennis Kucinich. You know, I mean, they, here in our, in our district. You know, so that we're all here of like mind in this, but we've got to, you have to talk to your relatives who live in other states, in other congressional districts, your friends, your relatives, kids you go to school with. This is, this is an emergency situation. And you have to do this if you're going to avoid gunplay. Because this thing that you're seeing right now with people sending letter bombs to people, pipe bombs to people, uh, breaking into the, the Jewish uh, temples and shooting people down, this is what the alternative is. If we don't do our job and get out there and persuade all of the people to join with us, this tiny minority of people are going to mobilize and try to intimidate all of us through violence. So this is what the alternative is. We have to show that love and compassion and solidarity and a positive attitude can always defeat violence. Thank you, Danny. was persuasive and a pleasure to hear. Uh, next we're going to have another student speaker, Liam Ruff, who is a junior at UC... Oh, before we get into this, actually, uh, there's cookies. There's yummy cookies and drinks, I think water? It's all good. And it's all good. You guys are all welcome to go and put your little fingers in the cookie jar, because it'll be good. It's really yummy. Okay. And there's a donation jar also that is near the cookie jar. So if you found the cookies, you might also be able to find your fingers putting things into the no no do uh, donation box. Okay, Liam Ruff is a junior at UCSC. He represents Fossil Free UCSC. Woo! Yeah! Woo! Yeah! Woo! Yeah! Hi, y'all. Thank you so much for being here. It's awesome to see a lot of people coming out, standing in solidarity with the youth suing the federal government. So as mentioned, I represent Fossil Free UC. That's a UC, University of California-wide campaign run by students to pressure the UC to divest their holdings from, their holdings from fossil fuels. Yeah. So if you don't know this already, the University of California invests $2.6 billion in fossil fuel corporations. 
Yeah, this is the University of California, a place where climate science is coming out of, a forward-thinking institution, but the institution itself is profiting off of industries that are directly contributing to climate change, fracturing communities, and only really benefiting a small fraction of the human population. It, the entire system of these corporations and climate change is fueled by climate injustice. The people who are making billions of dollars off of extracting oil don't live to, next to oil drilling sites, they don't live next to fossil fuel refineries, they don't list, live next to freeways where fuels are being burned, they don't live next to factories, they don't live next to power generation plants. And even though people in the UC, most of the professors, all the staff, they know these things, they know about climate change, but the investments of the institution are not reflecting these facts that we know. The institution is still invested with billions of dollars in this industry, profiting off this injustice, profiting off of people suffering, and the extraction of fossil fuels, which is completely, completely insane that even though we know these things, investments are still perpetuating the system. If people are making money off it, it'll be continued until we run out. So that is why students are organizing. That is why students are going to Regents meetings. We've met with the chief of the Committee on Investments and talked to him personally. We've, this fight has been going on for years and it will not stop until you see divest. Yeah. 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 If, thank you. If you are called to support us, there's a Regents meeting on November 14th, students will be there participating in direct comment, as well as having an action outside. As a community member of California and the world, I would suggest that if you can, write a letter to the regents or email them saying you do not support the UC as an institution investing in fossil fuels. So if that's something you can do, and you have social media, please find Fossil Free UC and Fossil Free UC Santa Cruz on Facebook and Instagram, or talk to me here right now afterwards, and I can get your email and put you on our email list. Yeah. So thank you all so much for organizing this. This is amazing. Thank Thanks for letting me speak. Thank you, Liam. I want to ask him real quick. Liam and I met at the Practical Activism uh, event up at UCSC just last weekend. He was with many amazing activated youth and one of the conversations we had was about the public banking question. So I wanted to just mention that really quickly. Chris Crone is present with us. Thank you so much for being here. He was a big part also in helping Santa Cruz City divest. So Santa Cruz City did divest and they have nowhere to reinvest. It's a real problem. So just really keep that in your back pocket that the public banking option is viable and we all need to keep our ear on that, okay? All right, thank you. Thank you. Drew Glover will be speaking next. Uh, he went to Harbor High and Cabrillo College. Um, he is the executive director of the project Pollinate to uh, get the city to stop using glyphosate and Roundup for yeah. weed abatement. A staff member at the research, uh, Resource Center for Nonviolence, a candidate for city council, and a friend, an activist, and a neighbor. Welcome. Thank you. Whoa. Hey. So, thank you, everyone. I'll make this really quick. Um, I really appreciate all of the organizing and effort that went into this event, and all of you to come out on this evening to stand in support with the 21 youth that are standing up against the federal government, which is daunting and intense but uh, honorable at the same time. I do want to take a second. Xander, was it? Yeah. yeah. I also want to be an astronaut, so just put it out there. Uh, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> It'd be hard not to want to be an astronaut. Um, so also, I'm the president of the United Nations Association, and it, that's the first time I've ever heard Project Pollinate uh, referred to as the Project Pollinate, but it's a great opportunity um, for us to address city issues around pesticide uh, reform and getting glyphosate out of our systems, but also uh, as the president of the United Nations Association, it's important to bring up the idea of refugees. So who here has ever heard of an environmental refugee? Yes. Now did you know that they don't have the same rights as normal refugees, quote unquote normal refugees? 
which is really intense. And it's if you want to go and look at the UN uh, specification and definition definition of environmental refugees, it's kind of disconcerting, especially with the understanding that climate change uh, will impact so many different people and will create such a wave of environmental refugees that are going to need support from neighboring countries and the wealthy people of the world. Um, another thing with that too is the Samoan Islands, for example. Did you know all know that they're under threat from climate change? It's pretty intense. The Prime Minister of Samoa has called climate change an existential threat for all of our Pacific family and said that any world leader who denied climate change uh, should be taken to a mental hospital. Yeah. So, hey, uh, it's pretty intense with regards to the weather patterns that they're changing, impacting places like Puerto Rico and the rebuild effort that needs to go in there. And it's the voice of the youth that are going to make a serious impact on what's going on, which is why it's so important that this is happening, uh, going on. And I love the fact that the movement shows the fierce urgency of now quote from Dr. King. I work at the Resource Center for Nonviolence and there's so much that can be learned from nonviolent resistance. I really love Danny for bringing up the concept of nonviolent resistance and how much power it has over the violent alternative. And it's important that in our work through this process of resistance against the federal government that we stand strong in the corner of nonviolence because as soon as we become violent, it gives them a tool <clears throat> to work against us call us all kinds of crazy names and destroy things. Thank you, yes, absolutely. Um, so another thing that Dr. King said is we need a radical revolution of values. And so that's not just on the federal level, but it's also at home here, uh, working in a grassroots capacity, engaging with people about what's going on. And just with that as well, I'm also the chair of the Santa Cruz County Poor People's Campaign, which is run through the Resource Center for Nonviolence. And it is an organization or an organizing group that brings people together across race, uh, partisan and religious lines to address issues of environmental devastation as well as the war economy and systemic um, uh, racism. So everything is interconnected. It's something that we really want to emphasize uh, and the importance of working together uh, and across kind of different lines. And just with this idea of standing up against power, there's a great quote that I always turn to from Frederick Douglass that says, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. So vote in November and make the chains happen together. Thank you. What's one of those, um, one of those chants? What's the chant? No. Anyone remember a chant? What was it? Something about voting. Anyway, all right, I'll pass it off. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you, Drew. Um, on that note, I, I, I totally agree uh, on the point of nonviolence, especially. Um, and I, I would make, like to make a subsequent point about not only moving with nonviolent action, but with compassionate action and with kindness in our hearts. Um, Sierra came up to me after I spoke earlier, the young woman who um, sang for us, and she said that we have to pray for the people who make decisions to open their hearts. And that really moved me. Because um, it's true. It, we can't be angry or, or violent. Um, and Zizek says the threat of violence is violence, so, you know, no violence, compassionate uh, movement and, and kind hearts will get us where we need to go, you know? Really great, Drew. Thank you very much. Um, next we have Catherine O'Day. If She's wonderful. Okay. Uh, she is the executive director of Save Our Shores, a conservationist expert in plastic abatement in marine environments, and completed graduate studies in two programs at Harvard, is the former senior director of innovations at greenblue.org, and is a kayaker and your neighbor. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and also for having me here. I feel humbled as someone who's been on this planet for far more decades than the youth who are uh, really standing up and doing something brave and compassionate and much needed. <clears throat> I feel like my friend Richard here, I call him my friend, we've never met before, I feel the same need to apologize that my generation has failed uh, in making a difference in stopping climate change before it became a real crisis. And we are currently in a real crisis. 
But back to save, shore, save Our Shores for a minute and grassroots, and that's our story, right? So 40 years ago, Save Our Shores was formed by eight individuals who saw a threat of oil drilling actually off our coast. Fossil fuel, let's go get fossil fuel out of our ocean, right? <clears throat> and this community said no, and this community stood up and fought for that and su succeeded in stopping that threat. 40 years later, we're fighting that fight again. We have, I always have such a hard time talking about the administration in DC today. I try to be respectful and honor the White House, <laughs> the Oval Office, and the person in it, but I just cannot, I cannot respect that administration and the people that that administration or that individual who leads the administration has put in place. He's gone out of his way to find people who have absolutely no business being in government and no business being in the positions that they are. We had the head of the EPA who had sued the EPA 14 times. We have an energy secretary who I don't think can spell energy. <laughs> and it goes on. But in any case, <clears throat> Save Our Shores mission today is based on three primary pillars. We went through a strategic planning process a little over a year ago and we asked the question, what conditions would be most important for us if we were going to have a thriving Monterey Bay, which is really the reason we all live here, right? We live here because it's an ocean paradise. And those, the three conditions we came up with were clean shores, healthy habitat, and living waters. And our living waters, that just sounds like a cool catchphrase, but you know it's really important, and this is where our organization is standing up and, and, and taking a position on climate change. We believe that we have to keep our ocean alive. And by doing that, we need to stop this climate threat. <clears throat> we have acidification, we have hypoxia in our ocean, we have rising sea levels. We're at a point of no longer climate, uh, climate uh, sort of stopping it, but we're, in the, we're at a point where we need to do climate adaptation and climate resiliency. And that's a very different strategy than stopping climate change. I always thought, you know, I've been working in the environmental field for about 35 years, dear God. Um, I always thought we would solve this problem and we would be able to move forward and kids from my generation, you know, my people who were parents in my generation, I have no kids, I have no grandchildren, and I still feel the need to protect this planet. It's not only about the kids and the youth having a, a quality of life in the future, but it's about the planet having a life. It's about our ocean having life. And if we don't have a healthy ocean, we do not have life. So under our living waters pillar, we have created a climate change info hub that you can find on our website at simply www.saveourshores.org. And that climate change info hub is there to help people in our community understand what is happening in our community related to climate change, how it's affecting our Monterey Bay, how it's affecting the quality of life. We are trying to make it as interactive and engaging as possible. We have interviews with folks like Dr. Gary Griggs, who's, you know, well-respected, highly respected ocean scientist who's done a lot of studies in this area. We have the climate action uh, adaptation scenarios from Tiffany Wise West, our city sustainability manager. We have uh, interviews with other folks. We have links to studies. We have simplified narratives of, you know, hard to understand studies that were out there. We will have curriculum for teachers, 
we're trying to build games for youth of all ages to better understand and interact with what does climate change mean and what's going to happen if we don't successfully deal with the situation. So I would encourage you all to visit our site, visit our info hub, and especially to the youth here today, I want to invite you to become participants in creating the content for that hub. I'd love for some of you to become bloggers, I'd love for some of you to become photographers, pictures that we can put up on that, on that site, <clears throat> and really be involved. Take an ownership of it, it's there for you, and I invite you to be part of that. And if you are interested in being a blogger, or a photographer, or a storyteller on that info hub, I invite you to contact our communications manager, whose name is Haley Allison, and is not with me today, but she really should be here today. And you can reach Haley at simply Haley, H-A-Y-L-E-Y, at saveourshores.org, and tell her you want to submit content for our info hub. Now the last thing that I want to say is I totally agree with nonviolence. I totally agree with love and compassion as the way to succeed. But I have to say, you know, I am angry. And I think you all should be angry. But I think we need to turn that anger into positive grassroots action like we're all doing here today. And I also want to say that, turn that anger into hope. You know, over the years, 35 years of working on the environment, I've had highs and lows, and I've had times of depression, and I've had times where I've even thought, well, fortunately, I'm going to be dead before it's really all that bad. But a lot of you are not. And I'm going to do everything I can to make sure you have a quality of life before I do pass on. And that's what I've been trying to do for 35 years with organizations like Save Our Shores. But you all need to carry that torch. And it is just so rewarding for me to stand here today and see that there is a next generation of ocean stewards, of climate stewards, of just environmental stewards and people who love planet Earth. So on a note of hope, which I hope our anger can all turn us towards hope, I read a book about five, maybe six years ago. It's called The Great Disruption. It's written by a fellow named Paul Gilding, and he used to be the head of Greenpeace in Europe. And then he became, of all things, a corporate consultant, working with companies to help them figure out how to address issues like this. And so he wrote a book in about 2012 called, as I said, The Great Disruption. And it goes through the scenario of all these things that we're going to see happen and all the changes we're going to have to expect. But at the end of each chapter, he has a refrain. We're not stupid, we're just slow. And his hopeful comment is that when it reaches the real crisis point, America will stand up and we will use our brains and our expertise and our hearts and our passion and we will find the answers. It's just that we're not stupid, we're slow. And I would like to suggest we need to get a little bit faster than we've been. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to the 21 students and youth who are standing up to the government. All of you stand up to the government. There is nothing more important we can do today than to vote. I've already voted. And we must change, we must change the administration in D.C. It's about our only hope. And if I could do a chant. Some of you will remember this from one of my favorite movies called Network. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore.
do something. Thank you, Catherine. Really, another beautiful speaker. Beautiful words. Um, I see that the people are getting a little bit antsy. And I, I uh, hope that you all stay until the rest of our speakers speak so that we can all leave um, powerfully together. We only have three more people. Um, but if you need to stand up now and get a little stretch out, maybe... You know, you know, yeah, whatever, whatever you can do to keep your, your body ready to listen. <laughs> um, we have another speaker, Grant, who's going to be coming. He's a UCSC student and a poet. Um, welcome, Grant. Um, what an incredible day we've had here. Influential speakers, passionate speakers, youth. It's important that we have actions like this and people coming together so we can really know that there is something we're fighting for and something that we can come together and do. So here's a poem I wrote. Um, I read it uh, at the EPA listening session and the main EPA listener scoffed at me when I said I was going to read a poem. But no revolutionary movement is complete without the poetry. Yeah. So here it is. Where did you read it, Grant? Where? Uh, the EPA listening session in San Francisco and they were appealing the clean power plan because the EPA is, uh, who knows what they're doing right now. Uh, not representing us, that's for sure. So here it is. The river flows with ease, the birds fly with grace. Our mother is pleased as the sun holds a smile upon his face. The fish swim free and the critters scurry low. A darkness is lurking and in it something grows. At first a spark and then a fire illuminates the dark, but the dark grows higher. Our mother is worried as the river flow so, flow slows. The fish dance with panic and the critters rush home. But home is long gone as the darkness has won. The fire in the night, burning so black, burnt so bright. And that's sad, because that's what it seems like we're going towards. That's what it seems the government has prioritized when they put the profits of corporations above the will of the people. We can't let this go on. We must demand action. We must come together and do something about it. So let's keep it going, everyone. Let's, let's keep this going, because the, the upcoming 50 years are going to be, it's going to be a lot of work. But I'm prepared. I hope you all are, too. Thank you, Grant. Uh, now we're going to be having Dan Halfley, who is a UCSC graduate and executive director, the executive director of the O'Neill Sea Odyssey, which I would like to take a moment to say was my first exposure to climate change and my first source of education and knowledge on climate change. I got to go on the Odyssey um, when I was like six or seven with my junior lifeguards fleet and it was wonderful. I saw a pod of dolphins. It was really, really great. And so I'd like to thank Dan himself uh, whenever he comes up. Um, he is an environmentalist who helped establish the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary, a husband, a father, and a neighbor. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. How y'all doing today? I can't hear you. That's what I'm talking about. Well, first of all, thank you so much for those words for O'Neill Sea Odyssey. And I actually wanted to uh, start off with something that Catherine talked about, which was the fight against offshore oil that began about 40 years ago. And also talk about another fight that's relevant to these 21 young people that we're here today to support. That happened 55 years ago in Birmingham, Alabama. Anybody ever heard of the Children's Crusade? Know what that is? So the civil rights uh, establishment, the movement in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963 really ran up against a brick wall. The city council there wasn't going to do any of the requests, any of the demands that were being made. They were, didn't have the right to protest. They were really in a corner and could not move. It was as though they were stuck from an organizing perspective. So what happened is the students 
began to organize, but they did it in a way that was under the radar. They spoke to each other in between classes, they talked on the phone, they didn't have meetings, but they organized. I mean, today we, we, they would be texting with each other. They organized together, basically in secret, and then bam, the day came when they had this beautiful action. The city had no idea what hit them, and the news media took notice. And it wasn't the thing that turned the tide necessarily, but it certainly broke a log jam. So that's exactly what these 21 young people are doing. And that's exactly what you all are doing and rallies across the country supporting them. And I'd like to also thank the organizers of the rally today for what you're doing. Big round of applause for them. But it's really going to take this type of direct action because we're running out of time. And, and Catherine referred to ocean acidification. That's real, it's not just sea level rise. We're gonna be losing wetlands along the coast. We're gonna be losing critical habitat, hypoxia, which is lack of oxygen. These things are going to really transform, if we don't do something, transform the ocean environment in ways that we really can't anticipate. The ocean is such a complex system and we have these very deadly tools right now at our disposal. We need to do something very soon. It's up to the young people because, as has been mentioned before, we have not succeeded so far. There's a lot to be done. It can be done. Look what those young people did in Birmingham. And we have taken on big challenges before. There was the issue of the, uh, the hole in the ozone layer. That was resolved. I mean, we can take on these issues. It's not impossible to do. It's up to the next generation. Thank you for being here, and let's go! Yes. Fabulous. Um, now we have another student, um, Monsieur Andrew Harris, who is a speaker and also a poet, um, and is a senior at PCS. Is that you? Oh my gosh. Hello, Andrew. Hi, everyone. Hi. So, my name's Her Andrew Harris. And I'm here because I'm terrified of what the future has in store for us at this rate. The global climate is changing so rapidly that I doubt that we as humans will be able to live here for much longer. And I really doubt that any life at all will be able to live here for much longer. Since the Industrial Revolution, we've been spewing carbon and other gases into the air. We've been dumping chemicals and toxic waste into our water. And right about now, nature is starting to treat us the way we've been treating it all these years. Burning fossil fuels increase almost every poli I mean, I'm sorry. They increase almost every problem that politicians love to yell about. Immigration, for example. As temperatures rise, massive swaths of land are left uninhabitable. So the people who live there are forced to leave their homes and seek asylum somewhere else. Another problem is that if we keep relying on fossil fuels, we're going to very quickly deplete the supply of both coal and oil. That means when those things run out and that massive industry has nothing left to offer, there's going to be an economic crash and all of us are going to feel it. I could go on for ages about all the other problems that climate change causes because there's no shortage of those but I don't really have forever to keep talking here, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna like move on. The point is that because of corporate greed, every single one of us is suffering, and that suffering is going to get a lot worse very quickly. Everyone tells us from a young age that we live in a democracy, so everyone has an equal say in what the government does or should do. But when our leaders can be purchased by a highest bidder, this isn't a democracy. When 83% of Americans want to switch over to renewable energy sources, but the government actively does the opposite, it's not a democracy. When the government ignores the will of the people it is meant to serve just so leaders can fill their wallets, it's not a democracy. At this rate, we're condemning ourselves to a future of hardship. 
the next generation, that will be our children, are going to grow up in a world on fire. And it's going to be our fault. Because at this rate, we're failing to act on the right scale. By not doing everything we can to reverse environmental damages of climate change, we are condemning ourselves and our future. We're being disloyal to the earth we live on, to our children, and to ourselves. And it's only going to get worse and worse unless each and every one of us pushes for regulations on big corporations who are responsible for more carbon emissions than the rest of the world's population combined. The midterm elections are coming up on November 6. I imagine you've all heard of those. And I expect every single person here who can vote to show up, because voting is a privilege that not all of us have. This is our chance to fill the United States Congress with people who actually care about the fate of the human race. It's up to us to show this country's politicians that if they fail to do what we want, which is literally their job, that they'll never see the inside of an elected office ever again as long as they live. Our fate is in our hands. So we need to act to make sure we actually have a future. Thank you. Let's talk about a little bit of local action just to make sure that we're all on the same page with things that we can do here together. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, to make sure that we're all uh, having the biggest effect. I know everybody wants to know what else can I do? What can we do? We're all here together now, we all care. Um, a couple things that for people to know that the live streaming is going on right now. It's on a couple different places. Um, we can go to Alan Lundell's Facebook page, A-L-L-A-N-L-U-N-D-E-L-L. -L -L -L. That is, uh, been streaming the entire event. Um, there's also the Facebook page for this event, the Santa Cruz Rally for hashtag trial of the century that has also a group okay so if you want to go back to that event and then join the group we can continue this because this is not the only action okay there's lots more to do this is not a one-time event the kids have informed us that when they get to court it's supposed to be 10 to 12 weeks when and if they get to court so we want to talk about that. Also, um, again, revereimages.net is another place that has all the photos of today's event. Make sure you sign the petitions that are back here. Pauline has been working so hard on that. Again, it's an emergency climate resolution right here in Santa Cruz. Um, and Gail, will you, will you talk briefly about some of the local transportation issues? Because as you just said, transportation is one of the largest CO2 emitters, right? Something like that? I believe it actually is our largest emitter of CO2 locally. That's, um, that's what we hear repeatedly at the Regional Transportation Commission meetings. And we have an incredible opportunity right now. There's a study called the Unified Corridor Study that's looking at Highway 1, Soquel Freedom, and the Rail Corridor. And it's looking at things we can do as an, in, as in an aspirational way by 2035 to affect our climate change output from transportation as a county. Unfortunately, right now that study is completely flat. By 2035, we're aspiring to do nothing to lower our CO2 emissions from transportation. And we can. Um, so th this is going to come, the staff, the Regional Transportation Commission, they sometimes meet in this building. The next meeting is on November 1st in Watsonville at their city hall um, on November 15th. The staff is going to put forth the recommendation and then they're hoping that the Regional Transportation Commission will vote on December 6th. And I would like everybody here, regardless of what you feel, this is a local polarizing conversation. It's not just our national conversations that are polarized, our localized ones are too. But regardless of what you think is the best thing to do, waiting till 2035 and doing nothing to lower our own local CO2 emissions from transportation really is not okay. So I think no matter what we think might be the right thing, we should go back to the drawing board and try to do better because Measure D, we passed it, we've got the money, we really could make a difference. And this is something people have been talking about getting people out of cars. The reason we're not aspiring to make change by 2035 is because everybody that's sitting in elected office right now knows the people that voted for them are probably driving cars. And this is, a, it's right now it's trying to keep everybody happy, but really we need to be aspiring to make transit work and to get more people onto bikes and walking. And we are a pioneering environmental community. If we can do this here, 
if we can figure out how to do transportation right, we can teach the rest of the world because to be honest, the big cities are already doing it. And the majority of the problem is coming from communities like ours. And if we can figure out how to do it right, we can share that and that can be a big way to make a difference. So please, info at sccrtc.org. You can send an email, come to the meeting on November 1st, look up the website, Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Commission and learn what you can about this because we can really make a difference with this. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, you guys, I just, I want to make sure that this is known, that if these 21 youth win, and I believe they will, that oil drilling will be banned in the United States. That that's the level that we're at, that they're working at, right? And I was on an organizers meeting two weeks ago with youth around the country organizing for this these rallies today, because these rallies are happening around the country today. And what was requested was that, that we acknowledge this is actually the beginning of a next level of our movement, and that these youth are standing for all of us, and that they're gonna be asking us, I'm looking at you younger ones particularly, they're, gonna, they're asking us to hold space, and I know Santa Cruz gets holding space, Santa Cruz language, for the 30-year climate recovery plan. So what's happening is, is if they win, and I, again, I believe they will, there's not a monetary exchange, right? There will be a 30-year climate recovery plan that the government will be legally required to implement. And what they're asking is that <laughs> we're available for 30 years. <laughs> what they're asking is, hey guys, this is the first rally. You know, and I noticed they sent us a lot of cool stuff. And I'm like, they sent us a lot for this one little rally. Hmm, better take good care of it. So we're just getting started here, okay? So if you're not on the Facebook page, look up Santa Cruz Rally, hashtag trial of a century, trial of the century. Because we have a group and we're gonna stay in touch and we're gonna gather and we're gonna rally, we're gonna bring all these factions of climate justice in our community together. And for the youth, we got you, okay? We're gonna get through this. So I just, I just had to get that off my chest. Thank you for listening. We have one final speaker who miraculously ran here from his other meeting just to speak. So let's put our hands together for Henry, Henry Lopez. He's 23, he's a California local and an environmental scientist. He loves insects, psychology, and botany. Yeah, so um, it's great to be back in California. Um, a few years ago, it was nice to you know run and jump back into the ocean. I did move to Michigan for a while, five minutes. That's perfect. That's way more than the you know mayor gave me. But anyways, okay, four minutes. Four minutes. <laughs> let's go. So I study insects. Ever since I was little, um, I would perceive them. They're always trying to tell me something, communicate with me. Um, my grandmother, she's a retired environmental scientist and a retired wildlife biologist. And, you know, she tried pointing out the ivy to us about it taking over a forest. You know, it was 1993 um, study, but um, obviously it's still out there taking over. And the insects from Japan that actually feed off the ivy are actually smart enough now from us nuclear bombing them that they can control our main species with their antennae and then they eat them and sadly to say um, you know cross pesticidal um, mutations and of course the you know chemical spills here I, I got a an environmental uh, request form right here because there was this toxic spill right across the street from my church and the environmental health services right over here on floor three wasn't even informed about it. Yeah, it was amino acids, Bill, but we create natural amino acids. And uh, see, the dragonfly even comes in and says, what's up, because he knows anybody that tries to disrespect me might get bit on the neck from it. So watch out. 
because that's how one I am a natural samurai and I'm not scared to say that anyone that's watching right now yes I was informing about the Japanese and all that I wear a Korean jacket because I respect Korea I respect everybody I love everybody and um yeah on top of that I just want everyone to realize uh, and recognize that um, what we do every day and how we do it is actually how it's going to be done and it says right in Revelations you know the locusts are going to come through but uh, we have a chance to make it stop before then um, I also want to say that uh, what's going on in the homeless community is actually going on in the insect world too because honestly they are mutants and honestly the insect world is becoming mutant right and I've perceived the mutant insects give our normal insects a shock in their mind enough time to take out our native species so just watch out for that And I am completely broke, and um, I'm a self-study person, so I'm always welcome to take tips. <laughs> here, here. I know my mom always says about the insects is that, where are they? That's what she, everywhere we go, she's like, where, where how come there's no more bugs? Like, where are the bugs? Excuse me, did he say that homeless people are mutants, or did I understand this? Insects, insects. Insects. He said what happenings on the homeless is happening, is what he said. Is what is happening also in the insect world. I think that maybe they're disappearing. They're also homeless. We're just taking their, taking their land. No doubt about that. No doubt about that. All right. Can you say your name and just tell us that one thing? Because this is important. Say your name. I just found something on the web. My name is Joy Hins, and it's called VoteClimatePAC.org. And if you put in your zip code, it will tell you what the rating is for every candidate that you're going to vote on. So please go there if you haven't voted already and check it out. VoteClimatePAC.org. Thank you. And um, we're going to post that on the Facebook page as well. Hey. All right. Thank you. What do we want? A day in court. When do we want? somebody you don't know say hi and say goodbye to someone you don't know three hugs before you go I want to say thank you also to all the people that helped Eric Muller on sound renegade sound has been wow. keeping it back there we got Pauline Seals and Angela Blessing and Ariane Gaida our youth planning members Camille and Eva and Xander we've been meeting for six weeks at my house partying it up so please, uh, stay. Doug Hold, I mentioned his name, made all this done. So thank you guys so much. And any famous last words? Let's hear it for the kids! I do have one. I'm screwed up right now. I want you all to know that the government conceded in their legal papers that there is climate change, that it is human-based. That's legally in their written papers, okay? So we got at least one step that the government has had to conceded that, but they're saying, oh, but we shouldn't be responsible for these kids. So we'll see what happens with that, okay? Love y'all. Good big round of applause. Thank you. Okay, and for yourself, and for 21 years.